The last time we developed the displacement body model for how we can use an inviscid flow to more accurately uh, capture the effects that boundary layers have on the forces which act on an aerodynamic body. Today, we're going to start by expanding that to look at wake modeling for the displacement body approach. So last time we came to the conclusion that the displacement thickness, delta star of S, indicated by how much the body thickness should be increased So that the equivalent inviscid flow outside of the displacement body had the correct mass flow. Now we want to think about what happens at the body trailing edge and afterwards in the wake. So if we start by just sketching a generic airfoil, if I look at the boundary layer growth, the wake begins here. where the upper and lower boundary layers merge together. And so this is the upper edge we'll call U and the lower edge, which we use subscript L. Basically, the wake is just a continuation of these merged boundary layers, but now there's no solid object between them. We still have potential flow everywhere outside the wake. Now, if the wake is thin compared to the streamlined radius of curvature, this would be the streamlined radius of curvature. Then the pressure will basically be constant across the wake as it is inside the boundary layers. Now, this is usually true for wings uh, or other external aerodynamics flows. Where it may not be true is for something like a turbo machinery blade. Now, since the potential flow that's both above and below the wake has the same stagnation pressure, which comes from far upstream, then if the pressure on the upper side is approximately equal to the pressure on the lower side of the wake, then that must mean from Bernoulli that the velocities on both sides of the wake must be essentially the same, and we can just refer to that again as the edge velocity. Now the wake has a reduced velocity, and thus must have some non-zero mass deficit. In general, it's also going to have non-zero normal mass fluxes, and U of S, and L of S. Will have non-zero mass flux across them. Now if we use the same approach on the wake that we used in the boundary layer to figure out the normal mass flux, delta rho v, we can write this as rho v of s and n u minus rho v of s and n l. And again we can write that as dm ds minus now nu minus nl dds rho e ue. And this now represents uh, a jump condition because there's no wall that we're going down towards. Instead, there are two different fluid boundaries. So here again, uh, m of s has a similar definition in form. when we were looking at the boundary layer. Uh, 
as does the displacement thickness of the star. Minus forty u over forty u the n. So the only difference in these definitions compared to the boundary layer case is a change in the bounds of integration, where we're going from uh, nL to nU instead of from zero to nU. Using the displacement body approach and requiring that this delta rho v for the equivalent inviscid flow and the real flow be the same gives us delta n of s in the wake with delta star of s, which is exactly the same result as we obtained for the boundary layer. So delta n now represents the thickness of the wake displacement body in total, not one and a half of it. So that tells us how thick the wake or the displacement body representing the wake ought to be, but how do we know which way the wake points? Over the airfoil surface, we have a clear definition of the normal direction due to the local uh, body surface defining it. So we need to know the camber shape of the wake to be able to fully specify its development. This must be determined implicitly from the requirement that the pressure is constant across the wake or that the velocity at both ends of the wake are the same. And this ensures that the wake has zero lift. Clearly the wake must not be producing any lift since there's no physical object there. So this no lift requirement can also be expressed in terms of vortex sheet strength. So as we know with the displacement body model there will be a vortex sheet on each surface and if the lift in the wake is to be zero, then everywhere in the wake, the sheet strength on the upper surface and the sheet strength on the lower surface at a given S location must sum to zero. Otherwise, lift will be generated. So the sketch that I'm going to put together now is going to try to illustrate the displacement body concept in the wake, so putting um, all this mathematics together. So here we'll show the real flow. And here we'll have the displacement body yeah, yeah. So the real flow streamlines are converging. This is all going to be a little bit exaggerated. Here's the S direction. The N direction. While the weight getting thicker, the vorticity is distributed throughout the wake, omega of s and n. This dashed line is nl of s, and this one is nu of s. The velocity profile We're not to zero anymore now, but some reduction. So we have u of s and n. And what we have on the edge here is v of s on both the top and bottom. So the outside flow is converging while the wake is spreading out. So you can see that there's a net mass flux into the wake. For the displacement body, we 
forget that the displacement body actually is a little bit thinner. And these are our vortex sheets, which bound the displacement body. So here's our end location and the height. Here is delta n of s. The velocity is now parallel tangent to the vortex sheets. And this is u sub r and this is of s and n. And there's zero velocity inside the displacement body. So we can see that. Again, we have an equivalent where we basically take a region out of the real flow to maintain the overall mass flow in the uh, equivalent indices flow outside of the displacement body.